Hello, I'm Sherwood McCaskey, welcoming you to this, the fourth episode in the current series of... Today is a funny night. In last week's program, our historians, having deconstructed that history that was presented to us many years ago, and placed it into perspective as it relates to the role of women leading up to the riot, those circumstances that affected their lives and the lives of their children, those circumstances that agitated them and awakened that consciousness and, in a sense, convinced them that better must come. Now, we ended right here on this bridge. It is the night of July 26, 1937. As Dr. David Brown described it, all hell is about to break loose in Barbados. Now, let us fast forward to 10 a.m. the next day. Now, around 1 o'clock that night, Red subsided, the, the rioters went to their homes, their different places of abode, the police retreated. But 10 a.m. the next day, July 27th, riots started again. The crowd met in Golden Square and they attacked the Empire Theatre for the second time. Again, the, the theater was, was, was attacked, the doors were smashed, and the manager of the theater locked himself inside the building, and he was taking a look outside to see what was happening. After they attacked the Empire Theater, they moved to Lower Bay Street. This is on our right at this moment. And on Lower Bay Street, there were a lot of um, garages, a lot of car garages and service stations. They moved into those service stations. For example, Cole's Garage was attacked. The Vauxhall Bedford service station was attacked. And they looted the service stations, rolled out the cars, from the service stations, for example, at the uh, Coles service station, there were two Dodge cars, one valued at 20 pounds. Those two cars were rolled out, rolled down the street, and rolled into the wharf, pushed into the wharf in 1937. Now, after the riots ended, those cars were hauled out repainted, refurbished, and sold again. And one of the unfortunate buyers, Winter Crawford, a Barbadian politician, suffered the consequences of buying a car that had been pushed in to the carinage right here. Now, trucks were also pushed into the carinage and gas stations were set on fire on the Bay Street area. So we have rioters coming down to this point, the pier head. And when they reached this point, they were able to collect stones. They were able to collect sticks because as you know, the, the, the schooners offloaded their wall of a post and their sticks and their stones, their firewood right here on the wharf. And these workers, men and women, and I want to emphasize women. Women played a significant role in this revolt. Women placed stones in their aprons, okay? And aided in the attack of some of the buildings on Broad Street. So in 1937, therefore, the crowd met here and divided themselves into two groups. One group went to Fairchild Street and did damage there. They tried to set fire to a building, um, the business of VB Hart, by pushing a piece of paper under the door. 
but unfortunately, the building would not light. They tried to do the same to the Empire Theater, but it did not light. So we have action going on in that area to my left, Fairchild Street. But most of the action, especially the significant action, occurred on Broad Street. And that is where the businesses of Cave Shepherd, Johnson Stationery, Whitfield and Company, C.F. Harrison, Collins Limited, those businesses were all attacked, show windows broken, and some rioters ventured in to these stores. One rioter went into Harrison's and found a woman there with the money trying to put it away, and this rioter did not ask for money, all he wanted was a kiss, and he was later imprisoned for breaking in to C.F. Harrison's having got his case. So we are saying therefore that much of the action occurred on Broad Street where these popular um, stores were attacked. But not all the stores were attacked. W.D. Bailey on Upper Broad Street and a very popular store, Fogarty, was was not attacked. Now, there are several reasons why Fogarty was, uh, was not attacked. First of all, rioters concluded that Fogarty gave them good terms, allowed them to get goods um, at a reduced rate, allowed them to get their shoes and their clothes at a reduced rate, and that was important for them. They did not see Fogarty as an individual who was trying to um, charge excessive prices. So the prices in Fogarty uh, were low and Fogarty was spared. But there are other stores on Swan Street which were also spared. So that the majority of the attack was done um, on Broad Street, especially Upper Broad Street and Lower Broad Street. Now, something significant happened on Lower Broad Street. Not only did they attack the businesses, but they tried to burn down the mutual building. The building, the headquarters of the Barbados Mutual Life Assurance Society. Now, that building, which we call the Mutual Building, was a symbol of wealth and power. And when you look at it with this, its silver domes, when you look at it with its iron staircases, you see what we're talking about, a symbol of wealth and power. So a conscious decision was made by the working classes to vent their anger on the symbols of elite control and governorship of not only the island, but particularly Bridgetown. And there was a movement, an actual physical mass movement towards what is now the Sajikar building, which was a mutual, where the Bridgetown men's club met, and where you had the big six, uh, shipping and trading, where their offices were. The idea was to burn it down, and if possible, burning down the people inside, to burn down those symbols of socio-economic and racial oppression in Barbados, burn them down. And these are deliberate actions of the breakdown of normal order and decency in the society as dictated by the powers that were. Let's look at the occupants of the mutual building. First of all, you have cable and wireless, a giant telecommunications um, enterprise. In addition to that, the Barbados Mutual, now Sajikar, had its offices in that building as well. And thirdly, occupying the top floor of the building was a recreational club of the upper classes in Barbados called the Bridgetown Club. So we have three entities in that building 
and you can see why the rioters attack the building. They're attacking wealth, they're attacking power, they believe that the upper classes, the planter merchant classes are giving them a bad break. They believe that the planter merchant classes had prices too high, prices of lumber, prices of food, uh, prices of the basic food stuff. So these rioters were very conscious of their position, conscious of their circumstances, and indeed pain was able to stimulate that consciousness, to get them to think of what should happen in the near future, what should happen going forward, what conditions workers would want to have in the society. Now, I just want to say a little bit more about the women, because sometimes we forget the role of women in this whole affair. Women went down to the um, lower green, took up stones, placed them in their aprons, and those stones were used to attack the neutral building. Now, part next to the mutual building, alongside the mutual building, were several small cars, Austin cars, mini cars, and these rioters set fire to the cars and they lifted up the cars to the window of the mutual building, lifted them up, hoping that the cars, the fire would catch the windows and that would set fire to the building. A number of years ago, CBC's Rosemary Aline, as then head of the Archives and Information Department, produced and presented a feature that, in a sense, gave voice to the riots. She spoke with the late Kenneth Grogan, who was in Bridgetown on that day. My car was parked outside because I'd taken up duty at 7 o'clock. And when these fellas were coming down, they smashed the glass cases of some businesses and um, they did break up some of the glass easter, the cars parked on the um, trees. Well, my car was alongside the building and they broke all the glasses at first. Then they were turned back by St. Mary's Church. Coming back up, they turned the car over on the pavement and then they called it a fire. Now, Edward Stout, local historian, tells of this event and he says to us that the, work, that the, the workers at Cable and Wireless and the workers at the Barbados Mutual Life Assurance Society closed the windows, they got the fire hoses, they soaked down the corners of the windows to prevent this fire from spreading. Unfortunately for the occupants in the building, the fire got too hot and the cars got too heavy. So they had to release the cars. But in addition to that, they were thwarted in their attempts by the police who came down and tried to intervene to stop the attacks. We are told that the rioters pelted the police, chased them away, but the police came back a few minutes later and they opened fire. Several rioters were shot outside the neutral, others um, ran away and hid themselves in alleys um, in, in the region and that part of the riot was dispersed. Now, I must add that during this affair, there were rioters who were actually shooting at the policemen. I'm told that in the, the Fairchild Street area, one rioter was perched with a gun shooting at the police, but he was later shot from his uh, position. Another rioter was stationed at 
the Barnes building. Now the Barnes building is over to um, our, our left here, but there's a new building here now, but right over to our left was the Barnes building. And we are told that this work, rioter was waiting to join in the riots. So he went down to Broad Street and he was saying all the time that the police were just shooting rubber bullets. But then he saw somebody being killed at the St. Mary's Wall. Now this is the wall of the Church of St. Mary. It was somewhere here in this general area where it all occurred. In that same presentation by Rosemary Aline, she interviewed a gentleman who spoke of a man called Hamdi, who, like the gentleman being spoken about by Dr. Carter, witnessed what happened here. But unfortunately, Hamdi did not live to tell. We had a laborer, I think a great, a great woman, good, no, one called Hamdi. And Hamdi was out doing casual work with a bow and shovel and so on. And uh, this thing happened, happened now. Everything suspended. Hamdi was getting back over to his um, to the department with his tools. Now, the, the department was the parochial building of the same area. See? In that little triangle there, right there. He was the man that was killed by St. Mary's Wall. So he was just an innocent person just going back to yeah, take yeah, his yeah. tools to he, work. Yeah, he had tools over his shoulders, so to put it down here. Now, the gentleman being spoken about by Dr. Carter, he also witnessed the shooting in this area and the subsequent killing of Hamdi. He ran back up Broad Street shouting that they're really kill, shooting people for truth. And he was so scared that we are told that he wet his pants after the episode. So we have, therefore, rioting in Broad Street. Now, what about those who are now seeking to put down this riot? Who are these individuals? So the riotous, the rebellious activity of the Bridgetown masses is met by one would say an overplay of force by the Barbados police. <clears throat> they were anchored at Central Station, which is about 200 meters from Broad Street, and they were under control of white officers, uh, commissioners, uh, directors of police force, um, lieutenants. Uh, the commissions mirrored those of the army coming down to uh, gazetted one, captains, captains, sergeants, and corporals. And our focus is on one particular man, E.B. Grant. And Grant is a very interesting figure because about over 30 years ago, I met him. He was still alive. Met him. He used to patronize the public library, as did Herman Griffith. And us who are young historians are now learning our craft or deepening our interest in the craft, Grant would speak to us about those days. So too would Herman Griffith. Griffith talk, talked about the cricket. Grant spoke about his part in the riots. And what was his concern is that, as far as he was concerned, he had a pivotal role in quelling the riots. And nobody, nobody was giving him the credit for it. <laughs> and one remembers Grant, a hulking figure. I mean, by then, he was uh, clearly a man over six feet, uh, my kind of size. And, and he had two bulbous eyes. And he stared at you. And his voice was gruff. Um, you know what? You know what, young fellow? You know what those vagabonds were going to do? The vagabonds were going to poison all the water in Barbados. They were going to attack the waterworks. They were going to poison the water. Man, they had a, they had a, a, a plan to destroy the whole of this beautiful, peaceful Barbados. So we had to deal with them. They had to read the Red Act. And I was there when the Red Act was read. And I commanded a squad of, of policemen, and we went for them. We asked Captain Grant, he was captain by then, he had been corporal. But did you shoot anyone? 
You can't ask me that. That was my purview. I was a policeman. I had a job to do. The right act was red. And therefore, what I had to do, I did. Now, let us get a better picture of the movement of this force upon the masses and, of course, that so-called riot act. It is important to understand the reason behind the passing of this act in the first place. And Grant, therefore, came from Central, and there are pictures of, there's a photograph of policemen coming up Broad Street and coming, that is, from... Uh, from Lower Broad Street, from what is now back with, well, the Colonnade, and coming towards uh, where the Telegraph Station and Y D Lima were, and where CIBC on the other side, and Woolworth over there. And that grouping of policemen is coming there, and Grant indicates that he was one of the persons in charge. There was a sergeant and then he was the corporal. And he paid a lot of emphasis on the reading of the riot act. Now, the riot act was uh, passed in 1838. It is a creature of the emancipation conditions. No one at the time, that is, people who were in charge of the society, uh, lawyers, policemen, uh, the governor, and the uh, ministers of the gospel, Christian churches, especially Anglican, no one knew how the enslaved, now enfranchised, would react and how they would behave. And the operative word was behave, because they were seen as a, a, a particular brand of children who had been uh, more or less given freedom from a long night of enslavement. They had gone through the apprenticeship period, 1834 to 38, and now they were fully free, as was said in Jamaica. No one knew how they would behave, so the idea was uh, to make them uh, condition, condition them to behaving in as subservient a manner as they had done before the act was passed, before the act of emancipation. Consequently, this act preventing riotous assembly all right, was passed. But in sum, what that riotous assembly act, or the riot act said that you should not have groupings, groupings of more than a particular number, let's say five. Uh -huh. No, it did not say of which category of people, either ethnic or social but it was clear who they meant. The ex-slaves, as they were called, the formerly enslaved, were not to gather in groupings uh, to excite the suspicions of a police officer above the rank of corporal. Any police corporal, any police officer above the rank of corporal, corporal and above, could declare that there was a suspicion of riotous behavior and that there would be an affray all right, a fray, meaning um, some tumultuous activity. And that is repeated in a um, Public Order Act uh, of, of 1970, right? And therefore, you see, uh, the riot act is there as a weapon to quell any bad behavior, quote unquote, on the part of the formerly enslaved. It was not utilized at 1838 because Barbadians were quiescent. Uh, and they were quiescent all along. And then we come to 1937, and on this particular day, the 27th of July, people in Bridgetown, and I suspect there would have been more than 100. So this was clearly a situation which had gotten out of hand. You had these people who were hostile to authority, already they had pushed cars in the, in the careenage. They were moving towards the, uh, the mutual building. And therefore, what do they do? Clyde Archer, having made his way from Central Police Station, he proceeded to this location somewhere here, and he proudly read the Riot Act of Barbados. 
and he was in, <coughs> instructed to do so by Frank Holder, later Sir Frank Holder, who was the Solicitor General. So Clyde Archer uh, read, he came at a particular point. It is near the Kareenage here. We don't know if he stood on the bridge or by the Kareenage, where people used to gather to meet the boats coming in from the Greenwood Islands. But in that area, very near to Trafalgar Square, which was more or less the meeting point <coughs> for a lot of Barbadians, <coughs> Clyde Archer <coughs> unfurled this official document. By the powers vested in me, I hereby declare a reading of the Riotous Act, Riotous Assembly Act, otherwise known as the Riot Act. All ye who have ears to hear, let them hear. And he proceeded to indicate what the Riot Act said, which is that you, uh, there was a situation in which they, there was a breakdown of law and order, and those of persons who were on the street should hearken to the police, uh -huh. and that in this situation, it was better that all law-abiding persons should hide to their homes. Do not be seen on the streets. Do not gather or continue to gather in large uh, groupings or assemblages. Uh, if you did this, <coughs> you would be doing it on pain of grievous bodily harm caused by the police or death. Unfortunately, the people suffered both, as we would learn in next week's program. Until then, I'm Sherwood McCaskey. Thanks for your time. This has been... Today is a funny night.